Good morning, good morning. How are you? How are you? Running a little bit late. Long-winded preacher. Yeah, thanks. The Lord be with you. <clears throat> Thank you, we pray. Lord, keep us steadfast in your word. Curb those who by deceit or sword would wrest the kingdom from your son and bring to naught all he has done. Amen. <clears throat> all right. I'm going to read. Let's start. So first week we talked about just the history of all things. And um, then last week we did the Apostles' Creed. And then today, uh, today I'd like to do the uh, Sacrament of Holy Baptism. So in a um, small catechism, <clears throat> obviously I'm going out of order because I don't like Luther's order. <laughs> I think the Ten Commandments should come after the creed and holy baptism, but uh, Luther was smarter than I am. Um, and the reason why the Ten Commandments should come afterwards is because we, in order to understand and follow the Ten Commandments aright, we have to be regenerate believers in Jesus Christ, which means washed in holy baptism. So I'm going to read to you, oh, maybe we should do the, a memory quiz. <laughs> what is baptism? <laughs> baptism is not just plain water, but it is water included in God's command and combined with God's word. Which is that word of God? Christ our Lord says in the last chapter of Matthew, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. What benefits does baptism give? It works forgiveness of sins, rescues from death and the devil, and gives eternal salvation to all who believe this as the words and promises of God declare. Which are these words and promises of God? Christ our Lord says in the last chapter of Mark, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. How can water do such great things? Certainly not just water, but the word of God in and with the water does these things, along with the faith which trusts this word of God in the water. For without God's word, the water is plain water and no baptism. But with the word of God, it is a baptism that is a life-giving water, rich in grace and a washing of the new birth in the Holy Spirit. As St. Paul says in Titus chapter 3, he saved us through the washing of rebirth and by renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that, having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying. What does such baptizing with water indicate? It indicates that the old Adam in us should be da by daily contrition and repentance be drowned and die with all sins and evil desires, and that a new man should daily emerge and arise to live before God in righteousness and purity forever. Well, where is this written? St. Paul writes in Romans chapter 6, We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life, or in newness of life. Okay, <clears throat> there's holy baptism. But let's back up slightly. What is a sacrament? <clears throat> sacrament. Okay, a means of grace 
means meaning you're going to get something. It's, it's, it's not an end unto itself. It's a means towards something. What makes up a sacrament? First, you have a, you have a physical element. If we're like, the word sacrament is sort of a, is, is a, is a, a practical term. It's a pragmatic term. <clears throat> and so how, this is St. Augustine's axiom, right? If you want to know what a sacrament is, it's got three things. First, there's a physical element involved. Second, there's a, what? There's the word, there's a command from God, specifically Jesus. There's a command from Jesus to do it. And then third, after the physical command, the, command the, the physical element and the command from God, the word actually makes it effective for, what is the purpose of the sacrament? It gives forgiveness. Yeah. Okay, this is the practical definition by which we say what is a sacrament. I'm not opposed to the word sacramental, meaning it, has, it is sacred in some way, but it may, may or may not match uh, all of the elements up here. So if we're doing theology by comparison, we're going to talk about where Luther and the, the Reformers and, and everybody got back to the original definition here so that we can look at the means of grace and say, okay, what is a sacrament and exactly how do we follow the institution of Jesus? And to do that, we're going to start with the seven quote-unquote sacraments that we came from, right? You former Catholics in here. So name them off. We got baptism, confirmation, I'm going to put penance way down here. Actually, I'm going to put it here. Next, Holy Communion, Mewage, Confirmation I got on there, Ordination, and Unction. Extreme Unction! otherwise known as last rites, <clears throat> okay? Okay, now, let's take Augustine's definition, the Lutheran definition of what a sacrament is, and kind of boil these things down here. First of all, um, holy baptism. Is there a physical element involved in holy baptism? Yeah. Obviously, there's water. Is there a command from Jesus to do this? Yes, go therefore and baptize all nations. Does it grant forgiveness of sins? Yes, absolutely, and we, we will come back to holy baptism, and I'll show you in Scripture that baptism does exactly what we say it, it does. So there you go. There is a sacrament. Okay, confirmation. Is there a physical element involved in confirmation? If you use an oil, I guess, yeah. But is, well, so no, strike one. Is there a command from Jesus to do the rite of confirmation? No, nope. closest we have is that passage, if you confess me my name before men, I will confess you before my Father in heaven. If you deny it before men, I will deny my Father in heaven. But there's no command from Jesus. Go, therefore, and make sure that the fifth through eighth graders memorize the entire small catechism so that they can wear a white robe and a carnation on your confirmation. Yes? Only the good day. Young. Okay, and does it grant forgiveness? You standing up there and doing something, does it grant you forgiveness? No, strike three, you're out. Confirmation is no. So it's my understanding, and I don't know very much about that, but it's my understanding that Roman Catholicism confirmation gives you some extra dose of the Spirit or something like that. Yeah, it gets a little wacky for me. Let's skip penance for now. We got Holy Communion. Is there a physical element? Obviously. Is there a command from Jesus? Obviously. Take, eat, take, drink, and does it give forgiveness? Of course, that's the whole purpose. So there we go. We've got our other great sacrament. Okay. Marriage. Is there a physical element in marriage? If you have a healthy marriage, there is. Is there a command from Jesus to get marriage? So oh, I heard somebody say yes, and some, most people said no. You'd say yes? There's a command to get married? I would say no, because Jesus says there are some who are given to be eunuchs in the kingdom. If anything, the default is for human beings to get married. It's not good for man to be alone. That's built into the hearts and minds of, of individuals. But it's a gift then for this, the, the eunuchs for the kingdom, as Jesus says. 
to be fruitful and multiply? Therefore a man shall leave it. Yeah, but I would not call that a command. Yeah, because, again, Jesus comes back and says there are some who are given to be eunuchs in the kingdom. So if it were a command, he wouldn't make like, some exceptions to the rule. So there's no, there's no divine command from on high, you have to go get married. That's exactly right. That's the unit of those who are single to devote their lives to that. If it were a command, then the Apostle Paul was sinning by, doubly sinning by suggesting to people that they shouldn't get married because then you can focus more on the kingdom of God. But if you're burning with passion, it's better for you to, uh, better for you to get married than to go to hell. <laughs> That's pretty much what he says, 1 Corinthians 7. So there's no command from Jesus, uh, kind of strike one, one and a half, you know, no physical element. Is there forgiveness involved in, in marriage? Some, some of you laughed a little, a little too quickly. That one. So the only passage we have from one of the Timothys, I can't remember which one. Oh, it's 1 Timothy 2. The woman will be saved through her childbearing if she continues in, goal, in godliness. You kind of made a face there, right? Uh, this has its, this has its uh, oblique connections to the childbearing of the Christ child, and obviously there's forgiveness. So that's, that's where this, there's this sort of sacramental aspect. Now, I'll say this, and I don't want to get too far afield, but if, uh, we're going to do, we're going to do all of this, we're going to do more of this in June when St. Paul celebrates uh, Sanctity of Marriage Month and every single day in June, and it has to be June. Yeah. We should get a flag, too. Sanctity of Marriage Month, uh, every single day we'll have like devotions. I'll be interviewing people, who, strong couples and whatever, and every single sermon and every single Bible study will have to do with the sanctity of marriage. And I'm not even going to mention that it's June. And if somebody says, why did you do it you know, June? It's so offensive. I'll just say, I didn't know it was Pride Month. They should really be more vocal about that. So <clears throat> anyway, we'll talk about this. Uh, the key to marriage is to, and if you've ever been to a, a wedding that I've performed, they're pretty much always the same sermon every time. Uh, let's see, who in this room? Callie, do you remember what the sermon was about? You do? Oh, yeah, that is a good, that's good. I was trying to put you on the spot and, and get you to prove my point, that, that is nobody listens to the wedding <laughs> sermon. Yeah, you're right, yeah, I will, I will sin against my husband more than any other person in this world. I do. <laughs> Uh, keys to marriage. It's not good for man to be alone. So a, father will, a man will leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, two shall be one flesh. And now you skip ahead to Ephesians 5. Let the woman respect her husband, and husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. This is a profound mystery. So marriage is designed after the marriage between Christ and his bride, the church. It's anachronistic, Right, Because Jesus came after Adam and Eve, came into the flesh after Adam and Eve, but it was plan A from the beginning. Jesus was not plan B. So he, the, the, it is not good for man to be alone because the two becoming one flesh is the fullness of the image of God. That's why Eve comes out of the side of man and not her own clump of dirt. At last, flesh of my flesh and bones of my bones. This is also why any sort of perversion to a sexual relationship is not just unnatural and antithetical to the created world, but literally mocking the creator himself and any semblance of organization that he has created the world of. It's a very serious thing. You know? So don't go around being a hater and everything, but uh, you, we, we need to be unafraid to say unnatural is unnatural, period, end of story. Some things don't belong in other places. So. Anyway, what was I talking about? Marriage. Marriage, okay. So this is a profound mystery, and I'm speaking of Christ and his bride, the church. Love your wife uh, and give, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might wash her and cleanse her and present her to himself blameless and without blemish. No one ever hated his own body but loved and cherished it. So husbands, love your wives as yourselves, just like Christ loved his bride, the church. And therein lies the wives submit to your husbands because he is the, the, you two are literally made for each other. That is your fulfillment of marriage. And it's reflected of Christ in his bride, the church. And then you go to the end of Revelation and the heavenly Jerusalem is descending from heaven like a bride adorned for her husband. And now we have the marriage feast of the lamb and his kingdom, which has no end. So marriage, 
Is it a sacrament? We gotta say no. However, everything I just described had to do with the reflection of the forgiveness that we have in Jesus as his bride. So we should very much be able to call it sacramental. It is very holy, it is sacramental, but it's not a means of grace. It's a reflection of grace. See? Uh, any questions? Great. Um, number, number seven, let's go with unction. Extreme unction is uh, the anointing of oil, the last rites. Is there a physical element? Yeah, there's the oil there. Is there a command from Jesus? No, not that I can find. Apart from forgiving sins. Like he established this church to go and forgive sins. And obviously you get forgiveness in the last rites. You could just consider this holy absolution. So this, again, we're just adding things that don't need to be there when we can really boil it down sooner. Um, penance. Let's talk about penance. <clears throat> penance is a more complicated thing in the Roman Catholic system where you come in and you, you say, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. It's been, you know, three hours since my last confession, and I've did it all over again. And then, uh, and then I pronounce forgiveness and then give you chores to do to sort of validate. That's the penance is like the validation. So it's, 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 it's too overly simplistic to say that they're, oh, if you do this, then you'll get forgiven. It, it's more like, I will get forgiven, now you prove that you are forgiven by doing the penance. And if you don't do it, presumably, then that forgiveness is sort of like wiped out. So you're still doing like a works righteousness thing, but it's not whatever. Whereas if you go to the Lutheran pastor, uh, and he says, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, then what happens to those sins? Gone. Are they ever going to come back? No, you have to do them again in order for them to come back, and at that point, they're completely different sins. Oh, I did, oops, I did it again. again. And you go back to the pastor and say, I did it again. And the pastor will say, I told you to stop doing that. I'm sorry again. Okay, are you really sorry? Yes. Okay, I will forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then it's gone. So penance, in our sense, is not more like a proving that you were forgiven. It's more, uh, a better way to put it is a fruit of repentance. So penance is you're working a debt off. Jesus already worked off the debt. So don't take away his job. His blood is more precious than your puny, stupid, good works, right? Don't rob him of that which he has paid a very dear price for. Believe him when he says your sins are forgiven. And in gracious thanksgiving to him for giving your sins, be better. I've just described the entire life of a Christian. That's why the older you get, you may have noticed, the older you get, the more sins you can come up with and the more mea culpa you get because that's you getting better. That's you realizing, wow, just how in the glory of God, how much he has actually put up with me. Like the phrase I thought of last week, I said, it, it is an act of grace that I even opened my eyes this morning. The fact that God has allowed me to live and sin another day <laughs> is an act of grace. And in that, we can have hope in actually the first article of the creed. Yeah. Pastor. <clears throat> Yes, so I'm getting right there. He's talking about the third sacrament, confession and absolution. And some people, <laughs> who are, we've had this conversation before, some might disagree with that. Well, I'm going to leave up this ordination here. <clears throat> we'll circle around to the confession and absolution. Ordination is uh, the selection of men through the church by the Holy Spirit to perform the word and holy sacraments. Think of like the, the laying on of hands, this is, this is our guy. The office of the keys, strictly speaking, belongs to the church. And for the sake of good order and in the commandment of Jesus, that church then selects certain men, and there's lists, you know, in, in Timothy and Titus. Come, we will set you aside, and we will train you, and we will uh, give you the authority to do the sacraments and to preach to us the word of God. And so then the pastor does this as a servant standing in the stead and by the command of Jesus Christ. The purpose of ordination. Uh, well, let's put it this way. <clears throat> Why do I have a divine call? Because the Augsburg Confession, Article 14 says, you shall not preach or administer the sacraments without a divine call, without a proper call, which is why these activities are limited to the pastor office. What is that call for? 
Yes, but you did too. The Holy Spirit gave me the divine call through you. I'm assuming you voted for me. <laughs> it sets you apart for whose sake? Like, who cares? You care. You care. Now, here's my point. I've heard it said before um, in, our, in our greater circles, well, you have a divine call because then someday you're going to have a really tough day and you can look at that certificate of vocation on the wall and know I'm where God has put me and supposed to be. So it's this extra notice, this outside of myself uh, reassurance that I am where God has put me. Okay, that's fine. I've had days like that, but that's not the purpose from the divine call. The purpose is for your sake. So that I say, I forgive you all your sins, and you don't go, can he do that? Right? That's the purpose of the pastoral office. So ordination is the one that sets these, these men aside. Now, the difference between us and the Roman Catholic system is that they view ordination as giving some sort of indelible character, which is why when all these priests were being perverts, they just shuffled them around so they can be perverts somewhere else, because once a priest, always a priest. Whereas we would say, no, we're not Levites. We're not holier than anybody else. Believe me. It's my office that it carries around. And if I should do something personally to mess that up, my office can just as easily be yanked away from me as it, as it was given to me. And it was not easy to be given, right? believe me. So, ordination. Is there a physical element involved? This is where uh, Mrs. Beckers disagrees with me. <laughs> Two sacraments, she's like, yeah. Is there a physical element involved? I'm a man. I'm a physical element. Is that cheating? I don't know. This is where. Okay. Is there a command from Jesus? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. Go therefore make disciples. How can you do this? I've set you apart. Ordination is not, an, is not optional. Having a pastor to lead a congregation is not optional. It's how Jesus has set up his church. Um, and then is there forgiveness offered by ordination? If, yeah, if you consider that the purpose for ordination is to deliver forgiveness, then yes. So we're going to put underneath there confession and absolution or the deliverance of the means of grace and put parentheses down there. Or as my, my good friend likes to say, he gives his uh, catechumens a test asking how many sacraments are there and if they say two, he marks it wrong. And if they say three, he marks it wrong. I'm like, no wonder everybody hates your catechism class. <clears throat> Can't get it right. So definitely baptism, definitely the Holy Communion. But in the numbering of the sacraments in this book of Concord in the Apology, it actually explicitly says, we would have no problem calling ordination a sacrament if and only if the emphasis is on the task accomplished by the ordinant, and not me. I am not the sacramental, but I am a sort of, my actions are a sort of means of grace, because you hear the word of God coming from my mouth, and in this particular way to deliver the gifts of Jesus Christ. Get it? Now, let's go back to holy baptism. <coughs> um, all of the misunderstandings of, of holy baptism, all of them, I'm convinced, from like mainline Protestantism or Christian denominations or people that don't understand it or don't think, believe in the true presence of the sacrament or have you know, weird views of the ministry, all of them, I'm convinced, come, back, come down to not understanding what a sacrament actually is. Namely, that Jesus has established physical things and commanded us to give as the means of grace. As opposed to, well, what do you have for your assurance if you don't have the means of grace? If you don't have what we understand to be the means of grace, like the word and sacraments, what assurance can you have for your salvation? You have your feelings. And I think we've already established by now that I'm not a fan of feelings. I think they are. <laughs> I asked a friend of mine once, I said, wouldn't it be great to be a sociopath? 
And he's like, what? No. Why would you say that? I'm like, because then I wouldn't feel anything. It would just be, he's like, you be, what? Don't ever say that again. So I'm like, feelings. I don't like the feelings. Um, what are you talking about there? If you could have a superpower, what would it be? To not care. <laughs> There was a, I did have a professor that said there's one way for a pastor to avoid burnout, and that is to not care. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, that's a pretty good point. So, so that's what I try to do. I try, no. <laughs> um, yes, you can even rely on your feelings, but obviously feelings are fickle, and feelings will betray you, and uh, different people have different levels of emotional maturity. Take a 13-year-old girl versus a, a 90-year-old man, they're going to have different feelings. They're going to have vastly different levels of maturity, and salvation needs to be clear and objective. So what you need for the reassurance of salvation, which again, is the whole purpose that the church exists, is to give forgiveness of sins, life and salvation, to deliver the goods, to give the gifts. It has to be outside of you. And your feelings are not outside of you. They will betray you at the slightest drop of a hat. So if you feel, this is why so many people in these bigger churches get rebaptized every couple of years, because they feel like they've drifted away from Jesus. Instead of realizing that baptism, true baptism, actually comes from outside of yourself. So here's the phrase. Great phrase to remember. Extra nos. That's a Latin phrase meaning outside of yourself. So, let's look at... Can I say something on baptism real quick? Uh, very quickly, because I'm Ezekiel, behind the time. Ezekiel 36.25. Ezekiel 36.25. Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> I think that's a real strong proof for baptism. Yeah, let's talk. So we're going back to, to holy baptism. When was it established? Like, think, okay, think about this. Um, Pentecost comes 50 days after the resurrection, and they're all together in one place, and then the Spirit descends on them like tongues of fire, and they all speak in different languages, and then uh, they hear the gospel, and they hear, whoops, we killed the Son of God. Uh, brothers, what shall we do? They were cut to the heart. So there's a sign of repentance. And Peter says what? <sighs> Repent and be baptized, every one of you. This promise is for you and your children. There it is. And your children. Uh, okay, great. So then they were all baptized, like 3,000 that day, and the church just takes off right there. So why baptism? Why not just, you know, say the sinner's prayer? <clears throat> Well, because baptism actually comes from outside of yourself. I don't know what I want to write up here. Um, well, I'll just keep going. Baptism just com it comes from outside of yourself. It's a reassurance that something has happened to you. So when I take the little baby up to the pond, who is the one doing the work of the baptism? Yeah, God is the one doing this work. When I say, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I'm not, like little Luke over there is not baptized into Dennis. He's baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The words that I say are the performative words that are given me by the authority of the office of the keys of the Holy Spirit set me apart to actually say these words. So you can believe that he's actually baptized. Not because of the guy doing it, per se, but because on the word combined with the water, He's actually making this happen. So now he can grow up, just like all of us, knowing that he was baptized. And he will always know that he was baptized because we will tell him. Yeah, I know you don't remember this. You were a little baby at the time. But you, are, you were baptized. Remember your baptism day in and day out. And I believe in one faith, one Lord, one baptism for the remission of sins. Uh, let's go to Colossians chapter 2. It's on page 984 if you have a pew Bible. Colossians 2. In the Old Covenant, what set you apart as an Israelite? 
Circumcision, yes. It's a blood covenant with the central part of manhood, basically. Um, blood covenant to distinguish you from the rest of the world. Not that you're walking around comparing that, but the idea is that from that comes reproduction, is the kind of essence of manhood and therefore humanity. And to have that blood covenant with God means that we are reflective of the image of God in the creation. So circumcision was always the sign of God's covenant. Uh, was it a work, was it a commandment, or was it a grace? It is a commandment, it's kind of both. I mean, it's kind of a tricky issue. At the time, yes, it was a commandment. Because Moses wasn't, and that, there's this weird passage where like, he wasn't going to, and then God was going to kill him, and then Zephora like, uh, did it for him or something, and he's like, okay, now God's not going to kill you anymore. And we're like, what the heck? What the actual heck is happening in this story? Oh, oh I love that story. The story of Shechem. It's one of my favorite Old Testament stories where, yeah, Shechem uh, took Dinah into his home, and so uh, Simeon and Levi, I think it was Simeon and Levi, they're like, okay, well, you can have our sister if you get everybody circumcised. So then they got them all circumcised, and while they were all still sore from being circumcised, they went in with swords and killed everyone. And Jacob is like, what did you do that for? And Simeon said the greatest line that every brother should say, should we have let him treat our sister like a whore? I would rather kill everyone than watch that happen. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> if only we treated cohabiting couples like that. Mm. <clears throat> I thought you were going to bring up the, uh, the, the mountain of foreskins when David killed the Philistines and gathered like 10,000 foreskins and like just dumped them out. I think it's weird. I love the Old Testament. I love Lisa's reaction. That's great. You save them and make purposes out of them? <laughs> okay. Okay. I have a really bad joke in my head that I cannot repeat. Um, you're welcome. Okay, so circumcision, sign of the covenant. We're looking at Colossians 2. Uh, verse 8, see to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human traditions, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. In him the fullness of de deity bless, bell, dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. Okay, listen to this, verse 11. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision not made without hands by putting off the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. So the holy baptism here is the new circumcision. It's replaced circumcision, only instead of a work of the law, it's a work of grace. And it's a work of grace because it unites you to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Verse 13, you who were dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. So everything has been nailed to the cross. Every commandment, every rule, every, everything that will give you some sort of grace or penance or, or, or thought process. If I do this, then God will love me more. It's all been nailed to the cross. And the means of grace that bring us into his kingdom are reminders that everything is finished. Everything is done. And you are just this lump of coal sitting in a, in a field, uh, that then the master comes and says, wow, what a beautiful treasure. While well, the rest of the universe says, what an ugly lump of coal. Jesus comes and says, I want this. This is mine. And then he makes it shiny and turns it into a beautiful gem, right? That is grace. That's grace. And that's holy baptism. Let's go backwards a little bit. Now I'm, I'm going breakneck speed because I only got five minutes left. <clears throat> Romans chapter 6. Page 942, if you have a pew Bible. Romans 6 is a part of the uh, baptismal liturgy, or not baptismal liturgy, the funeral liturgy. 
when we put the funeral pall on top of the funeral to signify holy baptism, this is the, this is the scripture that we say. <clears throat> Romans 6, verse 3, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we've died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> so stop sinning. But again, you don't hear that as law. You hear that as grace. Can you stop sinning? No, well, Paul talks about that in the next chapter. I don't do the things I want and the things I do I hate. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. But the point of holy baptism is that it's the starting point. How do you know that you're saved? It's because, is it because you have good feelings about Jesus? No, extra notes, because he took me, a lost and condemned person, dragged me, sometimes kicking and screaming. I actually kind of, I don't mind it when babies are screaming and going nuts in the baptismal font. Sometimes I make the water super cold so that they do. No, I don't. <laughs> I don't do that. <laughs> um, drags me, because the, the old sinner doesn't want, doesn't want to die. The devil doesn't want to give up. And then baptism is not a mere symbol. It's the water and the word that literally washes away. You don't have to skip there because we don't have a lot of time, but 1 Peter 3 is where this is in spades. Um, God's patience waited in the days of Noah when the ark was being prepared in which a few, that is eight persons, how many sides are in our baptismal font? Eight was, were brought safely through the water. Baptism, which is typifies the ark of Noah, now saves you not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So again, very, very much an actual thing that is happening. When you are washed in holy baptism, all of those sins are then nailed to the cross. Now your identity, because you have the name of Jesus and the core of his identity, is the one who was killed for us and raised again on the third day. So do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? The only thing figurative about our rite of holy baptism is that the, the sinner is drowned and dies. That's why, that's why a lot of people, and you can do full immersion or sprinkling or not. By the way, do you know why most Lutherans do just sprinkling instead of full immersion? Because once upon a time, someone said you have to do immersion for it to be valid. And we said, hold, watch, hold my... Hold my baptismal font. I will never do it. If you say I have to, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it the opposite way just to show you that I can't because it's not contingent on the works that we do. It's contingent on the word of God. And if he says, take water in the word and do this, then by golly, that's what we're going to do. So the old Adam is drowned and died, and then a new person rises daily. This is also why we invoke the name of the Trinity at the beginning of the service. And if you'll notice in the hymnal, there's the little cross there right there. And the rubric says, anyone may make the sign of the cross to remind themselves of their holy baptism. So that's all a crossing is. It's not some like magic talisman that's going to ward off demons. It's reminding you of the name of God that now is yours. It reminds you of your new person. Now Luther obviously, Luther also said, uh, the, the old Adam is drowned and died, but that bugger sure can swim. <laughs> and so we have daily remembrance of holy baptism. Daily remember who you are, that you have been washed in holy baptism. <clears throat> right? Um, so then, as a, as, a, as a washed and redeemed child of God, you are encouraged to live as one who has been raised from the dead. 
the old is gone, the new has come. Count yourselves as dead to sin and alive to Christ. Which is not just like, hey, be good and be better, but also don't be frightened or alarmed by any particular sin. Because it, it has no dominion over me, just as death no longer has dominion over Christ. Christ has given me a, my identity. So if I have sinned, rather than being alarmed by it, I give it back to Jesus. So in confession, you're, throwing, you're just throwing all those sins back up on the cross because Jesus has already, already nailed them to him. And since he's above and beyond uh, time, his once-for-all sacrifice counts for everybody, even, even Noah, when his patience waited in those days. So, baptism. Scandalously short uh, trip down baptismal lane, but it's, this, it's the Spirit's entry. It's, uh, it's your objective get-out-of-hell-free card, <laughs> you know, um, your identity, the name of God, uh, who do we baptize? Who do we baptize? Everyone. Why? Because he, he said so. All nations includes people who, are, who don't understand what's going on, which includes babies. If you don't baptize babies, it's one of the most offensive and egregious things when Jesus says to the apostles, like, let the little children come to me. They, they would have prevented them. They were, they were going to be like, oh, get these kids out of here. And Jesus was indignant. Let them come to me and don't hinder them. And if you scandalize one of these little ones, you should tie a millstone around your neck and throw yourself into the sea. So don't give me this crap about, well, we brought them and like christened them, but then when they grow up, they can, get, they can make the choice for themselves. Choice? Since when does your salvation come by choice? Whose choice is it? It's God who drags you out of hell, drowns you, and gives you the newness of life. That's the act of grace. That's grace. If there's anything else, then you have, again, robbed Jesus of the work that he has paid dearly for. So let's not dance around acting like that we can do something, that we can offer him something. Whatever we have is, is filthy regs. It's nonsense. We can just come to him broken and helpless like a little child and enter the kingdom of God. Let those little children come to him and receive the gifts of grace and forgiveness and, and mercy. So... Luther, one last argument for that, actually his first argument was if, if it were not valid to baptize babies, then there wouldn't be a Christian church because no one would have had a valid baptism for the first 1,500 years of the church's existence. I thought, well, that's a good point, if and only if you understand the sacramental nature of holy baptism. So, yeah, anyway. Okay, I see there's activity out there. So any, any questions about today? Concerns, challenges? Submersion? I can. Right, yeah, yeah. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Well, I think the Eastern Orthodox does even, even babies, like all the holy, yeah. Uh, except the thing is, I heard this from a friend of mine. Um, he's a liturgical purist, and so he wanted to do a full submersion. And in technically, in the rite of holy baptism, you're naked too. So he had a, a baby that did the full immersion. Well, what happens when babies hit warm water all over the place? So that's when he sort of changed his liturgics. One of my kids, when uh, Ethan was baptized, he was baptized in the seminary font. And uh, we... Uh, we're able to, to do, there's an a d- optional rite in the hymnal. I've only done this once, but my pastor's like, well, we never get to do this, let's do this. And so we baptized him and then put on the garment, the white garment, received this garment to signify, you know, just like, but right before we put it on, he like spat up all over himself. So it was almost like, okay, let's like wash you in holy baptism, like one more exorcism, and then... <laughs> And then the holy garments went on, and it was just beautiful, yeah. All right, the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be and abide with you always, amen. Next week, we'll talk about Holy Communion. I know, yeah, I know. Well, the pastor did, 
the pastor used that the next Sunday 